Welcome, and thank you for joining us. I'm Joseph Fritz, Executive Director for the ICI. During today's program, all attending microphones will be muted. If you have questions that you would like to ask our speaker, please use the Q&A toolbar at the bottom of your screen. We'll do our best to get through each of these inquiries by the end of today's talk. Those questions that go unaddressed will be answered after the fact by email. Today, we have the good fortune to hear from a recent inductee to the Investment Casting Institute's Hall of Fame, the highest honor anyone can achieve in our industry. He is a university professor in the Department of Engineering Technology at Pittsburgh State University in Pittsburgh, Kansas, and has been molding and inspiring engineering students for the past 33 years. At PSU, he is the faculty, faculty advisor to the American Foundry Society student chapter and is the Foundry Educational Foundation key professor. professor. Additionally, he has served on the ICI Board of Directors and for two decades has been our academic advisor and program director for our industry certification program. Here to discuss the development of future Foundry leaders is my friend, Russ Rosemay. Russ? Joe, thanks for that very kind um, uh, introduction. I uh, really appreciate it and, and I'm honored to be uh, have inducted into the uh, ICI Hall of Honor. Our topic today um, is something that I've been advocating and pushing for quite a few quite a few years. And um, the the presentation I'm going to give you today is a culmination of numerous things I've been collecting over the years about why we have to have this need to recruit the next generation of metal caster. Uh, and we are competing with all other industries as well. So I'm going to share my screen here and put up my presentation. And um, that is going to be there. Move some things out of the way here so I can I can see what I'm talking about. So our topic today is the recruitment of the of the next generation of um, of metal caster and uh, and really a a point to be made is that we are not alone in this and that um, all of manufacturing in general uh, is going to be experiencing uh, this type of shortage. Um, be before we really get started, though, um, I want to step back and look at um, how this is getting there and how many times we're really relying on past generations to, to help us to get that next generation going. And, and for that, um, what I'd like to do is, um, is, is talk about something uh, that, um, that we've been doing for, for many, many years, for, 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 for hundreds of years. Um, and one of the questions that, that people ask is when you're given a project is, I don't know how to do that. And so my point here is uh, we don't know anything about casting iron, um, but in fact, uh, I know someone who does. And this all came about, this idea of, um, of passing this on and really highlighting it for me, uh, came about one late evening um, was when I was flipping through the television channels and came across a TV show called Bonanza. And I don't know how many of you have ever uh, watched Bonanza, um, but Bonanza obviously was a classic uh, film from the uh, classic TV show uh, from the from the sixties and seventies. And uh, this one particular episode. Uh, in season 10, uh, in, fact, in fact, number 314 in the series uh, uh, on the 10th season was aired on December 1st, 1968. And that's 52 years ago. And the scenario of this little clip is uh, the Cartwrights uh, are in need of a repair of a casting, believe it or not. And I want to show you this little, this short little little clip. It's about it's about five seven minutes, but it actually highlights some very interesting thing. Now, now technically, uh, it is actually it is really very correct, um, but I want you to uh, uh, disregard all the safety issues that are that are in it, especially uh, since it's the Cartwrights and it's it's uh, it's the, the wild wild west. Obviously, there's a shoot 'em up uh, uh, scene here, but but we, we want to just look at this when we when we come back. Um, of what's actually happening here. So hopefully, hopefully you'll be able to uh, hear all this. 
Uh, and I don't know how many webinars you've been to where they're playing but Bonanza reruns, but but this is the one. How's it going? Going along fine. We got things pretty well put together. Well, do you think you'll be able to make some repairs in time? There's only two days left. Yeah, I think we can. The only thing we're having trouble with is this old broken cogwheel. This, this you cannot fix. Well, is there any way we can run the mill without it? No. Can't fix it, we'll buy a new one. Yes, you can buy a new one in Philadelphia. In Philadelphia? Yes, Monarch Foundry in Philadelphia is the only place that part is made. And that'll take a month to get here. sense as it can, but the Cartwrights don't seem to operate on common sense. Well, then we'd better be on the safe side. I want you to get me a couple of men that are handy with guns. You going against the Cartwrights? Yes, I'm going to make sure that the Lost Creek stamp mill never opens for business. Something wrong with this one? 
Very good chance. We'd meet again so soon, Mr. Cartwright. It's not Virginia City. Well, not unless you force us to in order to protect my property. I'm here to evict trespassers. Mr. Hanson needed money. I needed another foundry. So I bought this one. Lock, stock, and sand on the floor. You didn't buy that cogwheel. That's right, I didn't. I will take that with us. Well, of course, but in the same shape it was in when you brought it in here. Mr. Jack, if you'll uh, take care of that. Mr. Andrew, glad to. cash in the chips you should have sold when I was uh, ready to buy. Now all you can do is pick up the pieces and get out of here. Yeah, well, I uh, guess we know when we're late. That's very wise, Mr. Cartwright. You not only respect law and order, you know when to throw your hand in. What? Well, I, uh, I suggest we get all our things together and take everything that belongs to us. Well, that is one that is one crazy foundry uh, with all that excitement going on there. But one of the things that it shows is these these two young young people uh, had to rely on this older older uh, expertise to to get them through this uh, this problem. And and we kind of face that that same thing. But but many of our uh, older older um, uh, industry individuals are are leaving and not necessarily coming back. So. Just uh, if you wanted to go watch that video, watch that uh, uh, series um, that was in uh, season 10 of, uh, of the uh, of Bonanza, and you can go back and research that and, and, uh, and see the whole video and see the whole history of it. So it's pretty interesting, but it does relate to kind of this true thing that we we're doing. And so my example here is uh, I have an employee uh, who works for my favorite foundry. And if we take those same timeline, that same... 52 years. So here I have an employee 
um, uh, this is Larry. Larry is 72. Um, he started working for the company in 1968. He's been there 52 years. And you know what? Larry's going to retire and Larry's going to uh, enjoy the beach. He's going to have a few beers and he's going to retire. But one of the things about Larry is he was uh, at the plant. He was their expert uh, in solving a variety of different problems. One happens to be in the in the wax room. He was a wax expert. He leaves, he retires, and lo and behold, the, the area that he was an expertise in, they seem to be having problems since he's been gone because the company failed to train this next generation to take Larry's knowledge and, and pass it on. And so uh, one of the things that they have to rely on is they're going to they're gonna call Larry back. But the interesting thing about Larry is he really wants to retire. He likes going back and visit, but, but apparently he is now a consultant and as a consultant, Larry is going to get paid a, a consulting fee to come back. And um, lo and behold, he comes back, he repairs the equipment, does the adjustment, uh, sends the company a bill for a thousand dollars. And the, the plant manager is a bit a bit incensed and said, "I'm going to need a, I'm going to need a uh, itemized bill from Larry as to what the what this bill is for a thousand dollars." And sure enough, Larry gives him an itemized bill. And says, well, the adjustment I actually did was basic knowledge that we should have been passing on for years. And I'm going to bill you for that for a, a, a $1. But in fact, uh, knowing how and what to adjust, uh, that's going to cost you $999. And, and so this is, this is the idea of, of, of hey, and I, I, realization of what can possibly happen. We need to be training this next generation, bringing this next group of people in. Uh, to help us with this transition and this knowledge that we're we're eventually going to lose, and it's it's not uncommon that we would uh, do this. So the the idea though is that we have an aging population of our industry, we uh, have layoffs and lack of hires literally due to the current pandemic, and 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 companies are are losing a lot of knowledgeable people. I in fact have two students who who left the industry because of the downturn and found. Uh, uh, found better jobs that are paying them bonuses to leave those other industries. So, so we as an industry are facing some serious uh, need for going to be engineer and technician engineers and technicians as well as as well as line people and, and those type of things that we need to be recruiting. And so this aging group and here's a here's a picture of this this aging group um, uh, who are who are getting up there who are going to eventually leave the industry uh, and who have left and who have since even even passed on. Uh, they need to be uh, replaced. And our dilemma is, uh, what, well, how do, why do we know that people are going to leave this industry? Well, an interesting piece of data that was, um, that was done by Modern Casting Magazine is it is a survey five years ago, April 2015. Uh, they did a survey and they said, how many more years do you see yourself working in the metal casting business? And so again, this is statistically, this is just the people who took the survey, but interesting results that should be applying to us uh, since I've been talking about this topic for more than five years. Um, here's some interesting data. So the, of the pool of people who took the survey, um, the first group they asked, well, what, what, here's your questions. Uh, are you gonna retire in, in five years, five to 15, 16 to 25? or 25 or more years. And in the, in the pool, there was almost 30% of the pool said, well, in the next five years, I plan to retire. Well, if this, is, if this was 2015, this is now that five years. So, so 2020, we're gonna begin to see some of these people uh, departing our industry. And in fact, if we look to the next group, another 29% are going to go within five to 15 years. So we're looking at a, a group that's nearly 60% of the people who took the survey, who in 15 years from five years ago, uh, are going to be leaving our industry. And so this really leaves a tremendous drop. Uh, and, and this is also impacting not only ours, but I think this can be applied to all types of manufacturing within our industry. And if we look at other data that kind of helps us uh, support this, one of the things is, a, is the overall birth rate in years past. This information comes from the Bureau of Labor Statistics. And uh, there's this huge baby boomer group in here that uh, if you look at this big bump, uh, those people are now in this realm of, of retirement over on this side. 
And so we're going to see this bit all of a sudden after the big baby boom, where you see this huge drop and then finally it comes back, but all these people are now moving up and, and, and we still, these are actually fairly young people on this side. In fact, here's a little bit newer data kind of, uh, kind of reflects that into 2010, uh, where, where things, where things kind of leveled off in here, but in fact, uh, we, we had this big, uh, lower drop and these people, so this is the nineties and 2000. I mean, these people are only 10, 15 year old kids. Uh, and, and these people are in their twenties. So to backfill that, even though we have a little bit of a bump, uh, all these industries are experiencing all this loss. So we are in uh, some serious uh, condition here of the need for us to really start to recruit to our industry. Um, and, and we're not alone. Here's another interesting piece of data from the, from the Bureau of Labor Statistics. And this is labor force growth. So this is the growth in the labor force that's out there in general, that the large pool that everyone has to pull from, not just us. And so now look at these numbers here that as we begin to drop, here's 2010, here's now 2020 where we're at, where we're in some of the lowest labor pool market uh, that is available and now people are starting to leave and the, the need to, to do this recruitment and, and, and bring new people in is, is, is paramount. We really need to make uh, that happen. Uh, all, this is all, by the way, is again from the Bureau of Labor Statistics. Here's one that kind of breaks it out that's interesting based on men and women and the, an, uh, the annual labor force growth. And again, that also reflects into that uh, uh, in this particular time frame of our 20 to 30, uh, there's less women in that pool than men. And many times we are trying to recruit more and more women to our industry, primarily because of the, of the loss in, in both, that, that we have to really double the pool uh, and try to get from both of these uh, to fill this gap that we're gonna see in manufacturing. Here's an interesting one as well, uh, the annual population growth overall based on population. So if you compare total population to the workforce itself, uh, this is another uh, uh, lower number here. L literally, if this is our labor force, we're really half of the population of who's able to even work and, and help us do that. So the, the idea is how do we recruit to our industry, especially in the industry uh, that that sometimes has, has even more difficulty than other manufacturing industries to get people to come and work for them. So, so very interesting data uh, there as well from the, from the Bureau of, uh, of Labor Statistics. Uh, if, by the way, the Bureau of Labor Statistics is full of wonderful pieces of information. If you wanna go find somewhere to hang out and do some, some interesting data mining, this is, this is probably one of the best sites that I love to go to uh, and, and all literally all types of data that you can, you can imagine just uh, in general searches of population and, and labor growth. There's just tons of things that's really uh, very interesting. So we have to really begin to plan for this, to plan for this future, to recruit this next generation. And uh, there's, some, there's some key features that, that I wanna just start us off with is that even though we've known this uh, shortage is actually coming, I've, I've been talking about this for, for nearly 10 years, five years for sure, nearly 10 years. Um, but one of the truths about all of this is many companies still are not prepared for this changing demographic. They, they still are, in a way, uh, still trying to fight this and, and create good ways to, to recruit this next generation. So, and we're all in this together. Everyone in manufacturing uh, in the US is gonna, face, uh, is gonna face this. So how do we begin to plan? Well, we're gonna be, to be planning for the recruitment challenge. So there's a, the loss there is gonna be loss from retirements, obviously, that I've been uh, talking about that people are going to retire eventually, uh, go through general retirement in general, or if they don't retire, the good Lord will retire them uh, and, and things will happen and, and we'll get loss of, uh, from, from deaths as well. Um, I've, I have a friend of mine who passed away, uh, was a metallurgist at a company actually quite a few years ago. Uh, and the, it was a tremendous loss for that company. It was a, it was a prime person who, who knew every single answer and the replacement uh, really, the, the, lot, the loss of that person uh, and lack of replacement really was difficult for them um, in, in getting through that, that hump. 
Um, uh, and loss of layoffs. Today, we have uh, some of the industries, especially if we're in investment casting and, and aerospace, if we're in the, and not necessarily uh, land-based turbine power generation, and that's, that's still doing quite well, but, but in air, aircraft, in, 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 in jet airfoil uh, for, for airplanes, uh, that, that is taking a tremendous hit with people not flying. So there's a lot of layoffs in, in that side of things. So you're gonna lose those type of people. And then loss in, in employees just changing jobs. Uh, in general, is is where is where we're going to see uh, those things as well. So the planning for recruitment is going to be a challenge. We have to be we have to be very very active. And there's some things I'm going to show you here of of the extreme of being active, but um, uh, and that's active at local schools and colleges and campuses. Um, you know, I can say that we have a great pool of students who would be great for the industry. Um, but if you're in California, my, my students don't necessarily want to move to California. If you're on the East Coast, uh, you know, I've had students move there. Um, many times they, they don't stay. And so um, it's best that uh, there's an old adage that I like to keep repeating. It says apples don't fall far from the tree. And and I do have students who who will leave and go and do wonderful, um, but but the likelihood of those people staying uh, becomes less. Uh, and apples don't fall far from the tree means that maybe we look at local schools and local colleges and campuses and try to build our own pool and send them to training. Maybe 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 the school you're looking at doesn't actually necessarily do a lot of metal casting, but as an ICI member company, you have the ability to send them to like uh, the certification program here at Pittsburgh State. So, I mean, those are all things for training and development that you can do to kind of enhance those things. Be active at career fairs and, and company days and make sure that you're out there so those students know who you are. Uh, I mentioned social media, although social media has become kind of a uh, uh, a little political and not necessarily uh, uh, just full of ads anyway. So getting that face-to-face -face in career fairs or getting online career fairs, very important to be, to be active and involved in, in those type of things. And then, and then things like hiring interns and co-ops and, and remaining through, uh, through those things of, of good interns and co-ops. And I wanna talk about uh, that as well, about identifying this, building this relationship this way, that, that once you get students into your company, it's a good way to uh, get a feel for who they are, they get the feel for who you are, um, and in, get involvement uh, that way. If we talk about this development of intern and, and uh, co-op programs, uh, there's a little bit of difference. Interns tend to be three to six months. Co-op tends to be exchange with students. So we develop a great internship program. It really isn't easy. It does take a commitment. Uh, you can't just bring in the student and expect them to, 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 to just take over some, some project. They need a mentor. They need to be uh, 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 told a little bit where to go, uh, what to do, you know, where things are. Don't just stick them in some dungeon in some back room and expect things to be done. They need to have this mentor uh, that helps them progress through a series of projects. And it may not just be one project. It may be a, a series of projects that they can go through that really help and, and make them uh, make them make you help you make money. I mean, it's not, it's not, shouldn't be necessarily a losing proposition. I had a student go on an intern uh, uh, um, one time and a company called me and said, we see your intern has a, a great deal of experience. You know, there's a little bit beyond uh, this uh, basic intern that we have and we're wanting to pay them a little more. What do you think? And I said, well, I know this individual and that individual is going to make you money. So don't feel, uh, don't feel you shouldn't pay them what they're worth. They, this person will, will actually make you money and, and it worked out great. So these interns need to have, uh, like I said, a, a mentor, uh, either you uh, do three to six months. Uh, some schools actually offered a dedicated co-op programs where a uh, student will be at your plant for six months. They'll go back to school, come back to your plant in six months. And those actually work out great. Um, I'm not sure of the success rate of those people coming back to your company at full time, but, but many times that works out really well. They, they, they actually expect a job. I had a student on an intern uh, years ago who went on an intern to the company and uh, he the person did so well uh, that the, the president of the company said, you know what, we like you so much. We're just going to pay for the rest, rest of your school if you come back to work here. And so here the student went debt-free, came back to work there, and ended up working for them uh, after, they, after they graduated. So there's a lot of things the, to recruit that, that great person uh, that, that you can do. Uh, 
10 things though, that, that help us, uh, that I'm gonna reemphasize this great internship. Uh, and that is number one is no one understand the responsibility of employing an intern. Okay, so what, what, what is your responsibility? Obviously you're gonna pay them a, a wage and you're gonna help them find housing if you have to. So that's number one. Give them meaningful work is another one that uh, they uh, feel needed, that they are gonna accomplish a goal, that they're not, they have so much free time uh, on their hands that they're not on their phone uh, texting their friends and, and looking at ESPN or some, uh, some other website, uh, but that they are busy and, and contributing to the, to the goals of the company. Uh, be specific uh, as to what an intern is gonna do. So that kind of relates to, to the first, the second one there, meaningful work. Uh, you're gonna lay out a plan and, and give them goals to accomplish. Uh, what they have to do for their entire time that they're there, and and then and then an end result, a, a presentation, a result of data, of what they've accomplished in front of a, a, a group of uh, of people who are who are decision makers. Uh, set goals and objectives that they'll have to meet and accomplish, and a timeline uh, to get get those done. Assign them a mentor, a supervisor who's going to be right by them, making sure that they're they're doing this assignment, and making sure that's happened. Number six, provide formal orientation and training. Um, obviously, uh, we all do this with regard to safety, so they're going to understand the safety rules uh, and all the safety requirements of that particular job and organization of the company and full training uh, to take place. Uh, sell the program throughout the plant that this intern is going to help us solve some problems. And uh, they may need some help. And so they're going to go to other people as well to to make sure that happened, pay, uh, pay them a livable, livable wage. Uh, in turn, uh, are not particularly free. Uh, I know some people have called me, company have called me and said, hey, uh, I want one of these free interns who's just gonna come and do a bunch of work for me. And I use this uh, little note here uh, from Viacom. Uh, one ICI spring management meeting, uh, we had a talk um, about um, this particular topic of free interns and, um, um, there was companies, uh, actually the, 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 Viacom suit was about $4 million, uh, that uh, Viacom had to pay to past interns because they, 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 they did free interns. And, and if you're going to pay them a little livable wage, uh, um, there are label labor laws that you, you really need to pay an intern. And I just kind of want to emphasize that, that interns typically aren't free. Uh, require a presentation or report at the end to management, and then finally recruit, 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 uh, because you want to have an active recruitment of interns to uh, to your plant, to your program. They bring insight, they bring excitement to the uh, to the activity that you have. This person here who is going to bring some new ideas, new fresh ideas that uh, can help solve some problems. So it's very important to have a great uh, intern program and build that relationship with with either those students or, or the school they're going, going to. Um, developing a great internship or career take, takes time. So uh, the rewards can be invaluable to a company as well as to the student because you're, you should view these as, as a way to, to make money. We, we have an internship, a co-op agreement with, um, at Pittsburgh State, we have a co-op agreement with A.W. Bell in Australia. And, and A.W. Bell has an interesting view of uh, of getting interns in. They really, really want them in to, to make it valuable for them as well as the student. And uh, Sam Bell, for example, uh, uh, provides them with a car, helps them find housing, pays them a livable wage, um, and, and then makes them be integral to the, to the plant. And they're there six months. So uh, they get to learn the culture of Australia as well as learn investment casting uh, the way the Australians do it. So uh, we've had great success. We've had six interns uh, down in Australia and worked out uh, great. The ultimate goal is to recruit interns and co-ops uh, to become a full-time employee. That's hopefully going to be what you're going to try to do after graduation. And uh, you know they've invested both time and uh, time and money into you, and you've into them. And so hopefully you're. If, and what's the nice thing about a co-op and intern is if you really don't like them, uh, if they don't perform really well, you don't necessarily have to invite them back. Uh, but if you get a really good one, the trick is how am I going to uh, get that person to stay? Uh, remember, you're not alone in the process. So there's other people trying to do the same thing. And you're competing with other companies in industry who are vying for the same labor pool. 
And so you have to try to make this sale uh, to get those people to your organization. Uh, building a partnership with these local and regional and national universities can help you succeed in this endeavor. Uh, the companies have to know who you are. With all the digital stuff that we do, especially posting jobs, I mean, we, we have this uh, program in our career services office called Handshake. Um, and companies can, can be part of that and they can post their jobs there. And so this is becoming a quick, faster, quicker, better, in my opinion, as to how we can identify what the openings uh, actually are. So uh, very, very important in, in planning for this, this, this co-op. So I want you to work for my foundry or for our foundry. And, uh, and so we, we have to have a plan of attack. And, and if you are gonna recruit, uh, typically what recruiters want is, uh, you know, when you go to the store and go shopping, when I go shopping I, and I have to buy, and I buy apples, you know, this is, what, this is the picture perfect uh, apple that I wanna get. And, and many times when you, go, when you go out there looking for a new employee, Many times, this is what you're. This is what you're after. This is what what you're looking for. You want this nice, bright, shiny apple. And getting that nice, bright, shiny apple isn't necessarily going to be easy. Uh, and the recruitment strategies tend um, uh, to be difficult in many cases. And you can't hire great people if you're first attract the three eight candidates, you have, to, you, have to, you have to have a recruiting method. And most companies, uh, believe it or not, in general, attract the bottom third of the candidate pool. And the reason why, especially for us, is we start too late, we take too long, and we pay less. And that's kind of, um, uh, that's kind of uh, true all across the board, especially many times in manufacturing. So we do have a difficulty uh, in getting to this candidate pool to get those nice, bright, shiny apples uh, and getting those in there. Um, so um, many times what we can do is we can start with current employees. So they're our best advertisement. So that's, that's one way to get things going. You know, people have children who, who are studying in college and maybe they want to come and work for the plant. So sometimes that works out really well. Uh, you want to build a culture where employees love where they work and they're passionate about success. Uh, great people know other great people, so so that's a good pool. Um, I have a former student of mine who went to work for a company uh, several months ago. He, re he recruited his brother and two other people to come work for them at that company. I mean, it's a great windfall for, uh, uh, for the company. Um, employees can be advocates on your behalf. Incentivizing that uh, can also, sometimes there's refer bonus and perks for, for companies who do that. So those are common things that we many times see in our process. We want to set the bar high, set the bar high to hire some of the best people that we can, but but sometimes that uh, that's difficult. Okay, so so those are important, and and we have a variety of different recruitment methods. I I I um, one of them is to build a relationship with colleges and universities and faculty and 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 getting them into your plant. Uh, get a close relationship uh, with faculty is crucial. Sometimes select a faculty who know their students. Uh, that's usually pretty helpful. I get numerous calls from people for, uh, for, for jobs and re referrals. And, and typically, you know, I'm active in this industry. I typically don't want to send you the bottom pool. Uh, so I usually don't do that, but, but there is a pretty large pool and some of those are not at the top, but, but they they all can be, uh, recruited. Um, you know, have a relationship with the best students. They tend to have a relationship with the best students. They have the ability to influence the student's decision making. I, I want to say that that's sometimes true, not always. I mean, I've tried to recruit some of the best people possible, and somebody, some people tell me, mm, "No, thanks, Russ. I'm not. That's not uh, for me." Um, they can also sell the best students on employment opportunities with your organizations. And again, th this is difficult. There's family influence. There's location influence. Uh, so, so even though that might be uh, on on the on on a possible side, uh, I'm going to just give a little caution there that that's sometimes uh, not necessarily uh, true. And I more the recently than ever, I, I've had that success of, of be, and probably because the labor market is so large now on uh, the pool, the, the able to get a job is, 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 is so open that uh, they have better choices. So we really have to do a better job of, of selling. I just wanna show you this example. So this company called Liggett and Platt is one that really wanted us to, 
to sell their company to our students. And, and there's a pretty large company. They're located uh, about 30 miles from Pittsburgh State. They have 130 manufacturing facilities in 18 countries, a massive company, 19,000 employees. I really had no idea they were this large and, and located 30 miles from us, but they make uh, springs and beds for seats and chairs and, 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 and beds. And they, they, they have a huge, they used to have a foundry, they no longer have it anymore. But literally they went through this campaign with Pittsburgh State and we got special invites. So I just wanna show you a couple of these little pictures. We got this little invite and then a thank you for attending. So this box came in my, in my mailbox, inviting me to this opening doors thing. We want you to come and, and be part of helping us recruit the best people. And now this is really extreme, but I just wanted to kind of show you this. So inside of here was opening doors with dialogue. We wanna meet with faculty. We wanna make sure that your, your students know about us through you. And, and this is a bit extreme, I do understand, but I, I just wanted to kind of show that. Another way though is, is uh, for our industry, we have the Foundry Educational Foundation or FEF and, and FEF is a great recruitment tool if you're not active and involved in the industry uh, uh, recruiting. The, the, these people do a wonderful job in, in having a pool of universities where they, we know that the students are exposed to metal casting, they know what it is, and, and they have a career conference every November in Chicago. Uh, they just held one virtually a couple of weeks ago, uh, but it's normally every year in Chicago and they're trying to do a virtual, uh, another uh, event in March. So we'll see if that, if that happens, but they have a annual career fair uh, um, to, to help recruit that next generation of students. And, and what you get is a pool of students who understand what metal casting actually is. And, and so uh, they've been casting careers since 1947. So they've been around for a while and you see the ads in InCast magazine uh, where InCast uh, will be ru uh, running some of, their, some of their stuff and articles. Um, they're, they're an integral part of our industry. They're always at the uh, T&O and the, they, have a, they have a tabletop uh, at the show. And so they're usually always there to help us recruit for the next generation. And they have about 30, 35 schools. Uh, that they're partnered with to, to help recruit that next generation of, of students. Here's a couple pictures from their career fair, um, just to show that um, they're doing lots of recruiting. Um, this picture is actually very interesting because the people who really need lots of people are people like General Motors and all the people in this picture with gray shirts on. So this individual, this individual, this person back here, this one here, this one here, this one way over here, uh, when they bring a pool to recruit for, for General Motors, uh, they are bringing a team of people, just so you know, and General Motors is a bit, is a bit extreme, but, but I just wanna show you the impact. Uh, here's just another picture of that, of that kind of the career fair. Here's another one, the students on the right here is from Kent State, so in Ohio. Um, and um, the, the company there is Inductotherm. So we, they, there's a lot of different the people there, uh, the ICI, we normally have a booth there and we are collecting resumes that go into a resume pool that is on the ICI website uh, for members to access and, and, and look at and, and review. So we are active in there uh, as well. Um, so I wanna go back to my bright shiny apples because I know that we wanna recruit the best and brightest and we wanna get and make this nice pick of this beautiful, nice shiny apple. But I want to also show you this picture because guess what? Sometimes all those bright shiny apples are gone and, and what's left are, are these. And I want to tell you something that these aren't necessarily bad apples. My, my, my mother would get these apples and you know, and you know as well as I do that, that you can make great stuff with these apples. You can, you can pick out the bruised spots and, and get a good part of an apple and you can make great apple pie and great apple strudel and, 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 and not these bright shiny apples. The bright shiny apples aren't necessarily the things that make great apple pie and strudel and all those great apple bakes and apple cheesecakes that you can make. It's normally these type, okay? And, and if you were going to recruit, we have to be open to be able to go, you know what, I can take this apple and I can uh, take off some of the bad sparts and I can retrain and I can do some things and I can get a great stuff out of this pool. And, and that's my, my key point uh, in, in recruitment is you can get other great stuff. So I want to thank you for the time for attending uh, and uh, want to know if there are any questions. Uh, here's my here's my contact information in case you need to email me directly. 
Um, but but recruitment is an ongoing effort, and like I say, I've been I've been on this bandwagon for many many years uh, to get to this point where we're we're really going to see some some really need to to backfill our our industry tremendously. So thank thank you all for attending, Joe. I'll turn it back to you. All right, all right, Russ. Thank you. Um, just want to comment, uh, listening to you talk, uh, one of the things that you could have highlighted also is that December is our is where NCAS publishes its education issue. Exactly. And, and uh, the brief synopsis of different students from our member universities, and this is the cream of the crop, folks. So if you want to see who's out there right now, those bright, shiny apples, the uh, upcoming issue, the December issue of InCast Magazine, which is at the printer right now, uh, we'll highlight that for you. So thank you, Russ. Really appreciate the time you spent with us. No, no problem. Any, any time. And if you have any questions, um, uh, please, please let me know. We're always interested in helping you find that, that next person, that next generation individual. And if it's not Pittsburgh State, there's a variety of great schools uh, out there to, to help you get that individual. Thank you. Thanks for having me. You're welcome. Yep. Well, folks, this was the 13th and final webinar for the 2020 season. We had originally scheduled four pre presenters for this year, but with the cancellation of the Business and Leadership Development Conference, we felt it appropriate to further enrich this program, offering our members additional meaningful content on important business matters facing our industry. So I hope that you've enjoyed and I'd like to thank you for joining us and look forward to hearing your feedback on the webinar series. We're currently developing the program for 2021 and uh, I would like to solicit your assistance. If there is a speaker that you would like to hear from on a business related topic, please reach out to us and, and share your thoughts. With that, I would like to thank you for your patronage and support during these trying times and wish you a safe and happy holiday season. This is Joseph Fritz signing off for 2020. I look forward to seeing you next year.